So number two, uh, just to give us, oh, let's see here, I can. That looks better. Just making it so I can see your faces on the other screen here a little bit better. There we go. Uh, so just to kind of recap from the first lesson, talked about how God is unchangeable. And uh, hopefully you guys did your homework and looked at Mosiah chapter 2, the whole chapter there. Uh, and it just talked to, it gave a lot of good uh, uh, points of instruction uh, for us on how we need to uh, align our lives and conduct our lives. Um, and let's see. You know, I really like that verse 32. Behold, are we not all beggars? Yes, we are. Uh, God's given us the breath of life. Um, and, of course, you can go back to the recording to hear all of class one if you missed it. Uh, today, talking about the stumbling block of the modern day, uh, that this, this lesson is really a, 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 uh, a message of warning that we need to uh, perk up our ears, open up our eyes, and uh, be paying attention uh, to the Word of God so that we can be ready and be aware to see things that are around us. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 25 uh, says, and I've got it on the screen, look it up on your scriptures. It says, and again, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. And as we uh, kind of look into the scripture and go through the class, this is going to be one of our uh, main scriptures for tonight. There's a lot of, uh, quote, uh, shepherds out there, that, and some of them are true, some of them are false, or, you know, and we want to follow a true prophet. We only want to follow the prophet in as much as uh, the prophet is following Jesus Christ. And uh, that's why we find ourselves where, where we are today. But uh, as we go through this, we're going to look a little bit at the testimony of Joseph Smith, uh, looking at the fruit. And we're going to uh, kind of see through that and, and the restoration, whether the fruit was good or whether it was bad and how it compares to the, uh, the rest of Christianity. And the second scripture that we're really going to look into, I had to, uh, when Brother Luff was using this, I was kind of thinking, okay, where's he going with these two scriptures? They're two, two totally different topics. But as we go along here, you're going to see. Uh, could I have a reader for that one? It's Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. Who would read that? I will. All right, Steve. Thank you. Sure. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and great bulwarks against it. And there was found in a, it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered the same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. All right, thank you. Any thoughts before I give you mine? Well, I believe he's pointing out, you know, that uh, they, they could have reacted differently in the little city but the poor wise man gave them his wisdom and yet we despise the uh the wisdom that comes from god generally uh, as the world's view and that's what i'm thinking the meaning is that uh brother luff had yep <clears throat> yeah that's uh, right on and and he'll actually go through and i think we kind of touch it towards the end uh where he he brings us up and he says that uh uh Joseph Smith, or the restored gospel, the restored message, it's likened into this poor wise man who gives the wisdom on how to deliver the city, and they take the wisdom, but but they you know they, or they heed the wisdom, but yet they don't remember the source from what it came from, and there's some interesting things coming up to that. We 
which kind of goes along with this next thought, uh, poor reception. Uh, maybe you're thinking poor reception of a cell phone at first, but uh, uh, there's a different application here. Uh, Luff says, like its author, truth comes to its own and its own receives it not. And I suspect he was taking a look at section 45 quoted there at the bottom, uh, where it says, but they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. And, uh, you know, really this whole, uh, this whole lesson, it's, it, in my, uh, my own words, it's like, uh, you know, we live in a world where there is a lot of noise. And we need to be able to decipher through the noise and discern what is truth, what is the true word of God. Um, and that can be difficult. We need to be on section 45. We need to be able to perceive the light. You can see here uh, the other quote uh, from Brother Luff. Uh, he says, those busiest in painting and garnishing the tombs of dead prophets are generally, uh, should be first, that's a typo on my part, uh, to bring the stone and cross uh, for the living ones. And, and as we're going to see here in Scripture, so many times uh, they'll reference things of the past, uh, people, generically speaking, and uh, they'll say that the past was right, but then when, when God is continuing his work, they won't want to accept that as it is in that living day. Um, which goes on to what he's saying there, those who make themselves hoarse and crying, we know that God spake to Moses. They know the past, and they're generally ready to vary their speech. We see that today. We'll twist it and make it uh, to what uh, would be more beneficial to what we want to do. And the occasional away with them, crucify them, when their attention is called to Jesus Christ. We saw that in the New Testament many times, right? This is kind of a callback to the first lesson about our inheritance. Uh, Third Nephi chapter 4, verse 46 through 48. Could I have a reader for this scripture? I didn't cry. All right. Um, Third Nephi 4, 46 to 48. I came unto my own, and my own received me not. And the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled. And as many as have received me, to them have I given to become the sons of God. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name. For behold, by me redemption cometh, and in me is the law of Moses fulfilled. I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Thank you, Tim. So Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. Uh, and I like this. The scriptures concerning him were fulfilled. He always, he never said that he was, you know, changing things. He was fulfilling things. That's a big difference. And uh, this 47, that, that's what's the call back to the first lesson. Uh, if we receive him, if we believe on him, which means we'd follow him. Uh, do what he asks us to do, will become the sons of God, which is a miraculous promise. All right, now that we got those things set up, all ancient revelation was once modern, and its first advocates in any age were, uh, this is a, it's a tough word, I've, I've listened to it on Google and how to pronounce it, and I mess it up every time, uh, an anathematized, uh, which means cursed. Um, so what's that saying is things in the past, they obviously once happened, right? So th at that moment, it was modern. And at that moment, the people that were presenting that message, no matter what age, no matter what uh, sample of history you look at, when it's the truth, 
it almost always seems to be the case there's somebody or some group of people, sometimes everybody, that they want to curse that individual that is uh, teaching and preaching and expounding the truth. And our first example we see of that here, or at least for tonight anyway, comes straight out of Genesis, the eighth chapter. And <clears throat> you notice I've got three verses broken out there. Uh, two of them you only find in the inspired version, or at least I, I tried to find it in the King James, I couldn't. Uh, there's one verse that, uh, chapter 8, verse 5, inspired, or chapter 6, verse 3, King James, that's identical. And it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with man. For he shall know that all flesh shall die, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And if men do not repent, I will send in the floods upon them. Now that's what we get out of the King James. With the restored gospel, we get a little more detail of what, uh, what Noah's response was, uh, what his message was to the people. And we find that in verse 8 and verse 11. Verse 8, came to pass that Noah called upon the children of men that they should repent, passing along the message. But they hearkened not unto his words. And he preached that for 120 years. Uh, and it came to pass that Noah, verse 11, continued his preaching, continued that, 120 years, and give heed unto my words, saying to give heed unto my words. And this was with the words, believe and repent of your sins, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, even as our fathers did. See that message is same from the beginning. And ye shall receive the Holy Ghost, that you may have all things made manifest. And of course, you can read other verses, and it says, and, uh, you know, if you do this, you're, you're not going to die in the coming flood. They didn't hearken to the, his words. Only his uh, part of his family. You know, Noah lost part of his family, too. It wasn't just his whole family, just part of his family that was on the ark. Eight people, including him. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I uh, did an online preaching on this a couple weeks ago. And then reading this and laughing, thinking, okay, this is confirmation that maybe we do live in these days, which is coming up in a couple slides here. Well, actually, the next slide, rather, as it was in the days of Noah. And I gave those two verses there, uh, Mark 13 and Mark Matthew 24. And I believe this is the same, if not very close to the same in the King James, maybe different verses. Uh, could I have someone read this scripture for us? Hi, Mark. I'll read that. All right. <clears throat> but as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be also at the coming of the Son of Man. For it shall be with them as it was in the days which were before the flood. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark, they were eating and drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Pharisees of... Do you want me to just oh, pause? No, that's, that's good there. That's good there. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that going right back to this so we know the story of noah right uh it, it didn't work out so good and it's it's so it's really such a sad story that they just would not listen to the voice of truth the voice of reason and you know noah if you read the chapter here it wasn't easy for him it wasn't just a matter of nobody listened to him and only you know seven converts of which was his family uh, they, people sought to take his life. You'll find that in there. Uh, you know, he, he was not, as far as this world is concerned, he was not in a safe position. Uh, and, and it'll tell you too that uh, he, uh, uh, that he was protected by God. But I think that's just interesting to point out that it, 
you know, just it wasn't easy for him, uh, no matter what aspect you were looking at. It's so much more than just uh, how they'll show in some of the, the kid movies, how maybe they came and mocked at him as he's building the ark. It was much more than that. So Luff here, he says, Pharisees of this age shed tears as they read and think of 120 years spent by, his, by this faithful patriarch Noah in a fruitless effort to proclaim those heedless hearers. And they denounce the hard-heartedness and the stiff-neckedness of such people. Yet, they forget or are indifferent to the intimation. They are today despising as grand an overture from heaven, as was extended by Noah. And, it, and that's uh, an interesting quote from him, you know, pointing out that they recognize what happened in the past, uh, but they really don't see that history is repeating itself and we're falling for the, we're really, really falling for the same mistakes. And it's this continual stumbling block that we keep going over and over and over. So let's look at another example, Jesus in the millennium of time. Jesus asked his, uh, his hearers to search the scriptures. You can look at John 540 for that. But to go a little deeper into the fifth chapter of John, you look at verse 47 through 48. It says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how are you gonna how shall you believe my words? I think there's some good insight there from Jesus. And it's really it's pretty simple. Moses pointed to Christ. The whole Mosaic law all pointed to Christ. And they got hooked up into the tradition and the ritual part of everything. And they forgot the reason that they were doing it. You know, we can think of that in, in a lot of different terms and applications today. But, you know, you can think of a different simple things like why do we have a... Uh, opening prayer at the beginning. There's a reason for that. Or, you know, for the the sacrament meeting, why do we have the sacrament early in the service? You know, of course, Dr. Gunnis tells us why, but there's reason behind everything that we do. But if we're not actively engaged in searching for the truth and understanding the truth, we'll, uh, uh, we can kind of get hooked up in the tradition, not the purpose of why we're doing what we're doing. Brother Luff says, but they did not believe Moses nor the scriptures. I like how he words this intelligently. They beloved, they, uh, beloved the corrupt traditions that have reached them and which uh, were being presented as interpretation of the scriptures by their priest. You see right there was an issue. Uh, they were relying upon the priest to know what the word of God said. And, you know, as long as the priest is following God, that's fine. But once they fall into that habit of the traditions and corrupting it and not understand the purpose, things begin to get lost, begin to be lost. So hence their eyes were blinded to the true intent and the facts of Moses and the prophets that Jesus came to fulfill and unfold the law. And that's the reason God sent him. So here we have Luke at the bottom of the screen, Luke chapter 24, verse 43. Would someone read that one for us? I can, Mark. All right. Luke 24, 43. And he... Jesus said unto them, the disciples, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Thank you. Of course, you know, if, if you're realizing the chapter number here, this is 
after Jesus has been resurrected. Uh, so he's, you know, he's went back to the disciples and he's explaining, you know, these are the words, you know, that I spake to you. I, I taught you all these things so that you could see that everything that I was doing, it was for a purpose. It was to fulfill the law which I gave Moses. To fulfill all the prophecies concerning me that the prophets wrote about me. Both the, you know, in the books of the prophets, in the Psalms, everything. And of course, I don't remember if it was on last class or if, uh, what, what media source it, it was talking. Uh, I, I was kind of bringing this up. It's, you know, there were so many things that had to transpire for Jesus uh, to fulfill. It would be impossible for any man to do it. Uh, you know, I mean, there were things that were just even outside of uh, his control per se, you know, like the, uh, like the soldiers casting lots for his garments, for example, sure. or what time he would uh, pass away. Uh, Steve? Well, uh, these points that you've just made about trusting the priest, uh, they, they're touching home right now. I've got a cousin in a hospice situation and uh they're relying completely on his deathbed uh repentance and uh you know whether it's uh a certain priest in a certain church or whether it's the the preacher down at the corner you know these things kind of touch home in the fact that the most the two most important questions about salvation is you know does Christ actually know you, and do you actually know him? So that's what I wanted to share on as far as what I thought was important with what you were saying. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Be praying for your, you said your cousin? Yes, thank you. I meant to do prayer requests at the beginning. I'll do that at the end here. So let's look at a third example. Now, mind you, this is all New Test or uh, in the Bible. Uh, there's a number of examples we could have looked at in the Book of Mormon too. Um, but if you look at Paul the Apostle, I just got to read what Luff had to say about Paul, and then when I get done with that, if I could have someone read uh, this, the Second Timothy chapter three scripture there, verse four and five. Luff says Paul stood up for the house of Israel and endeavored from their own scriptures to prove Jesus to be the central figure connected therewith, the Christ indeed. But he was branded a heretic and denounced as a pestilent fellow, a stirrer up of strife, a problem child. Paul was beaten, imprisoned, and then finally slain. So, you know, just another example. So let's, uh, that, and that's why I picked, I, just, I mean, there's a lot of scriptures we could pick from Paul here, but I thought this one was, uh, uh, kind of has a twofold purpose in sharing tonight. So someone got that for me, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Hi, Will. That's All right. Traitors, traitors heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So, like I said, twofold reason here. Uh, number one, that doesn't sound like a very positive message. Um, if I was trying to win votes, that's sure not the way to uh, present myself and my message that I'm trying to share with you. Uh, because basically, is that not just saying, and you can read the verses in, uh, in front of that. Uh, it's just going to offend everybody. And the second thing is this starts to tie into the purpose of the restoration. The uh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This is one of the concepts that uh, Joseph Smith came across and, and was told, um, uh, I have to read his testimony, I think it's by the angel. Um, if it's not, it's, it's from Christ. Um, either way, 
it's from divine uh, appointment. Uh, well, and then we'll also touch on lovers of pleasure more and lovers of God too. So I guess it's really a threefold reason here, kind of set us up. So here we've looked at uh, three examples in Scripture. Today, this is left talking. And this was back in, uh, and I didn't even look at when this was exactly written, 1903. So here we are another 120 years later, nearly. And uh, I think we're still in the same position. It's just our voice isn't heard as well. So today we're just called heretics. Not because we denounce the Bible, but because we uphold it. We appeal to the scriptures and contend for the faith. Thousands are building churches in the names of dead apostles and prophets. Yeah, I, on that statement there, I was thinking, you know, uh, Nick and I, we've been driving around Council Bus a little more with the cheap gas and uh, kind of been enjoying that uh, ability to just drive around. And it's ama it is amazing how many churches are named after about everything except for Jesus. And uh, like there was one called the Church of the Brethren. I'm thinking, okay, that's a different one. I'm sure there's great people in there, but still, it's not the Church of Jesus. So, uh, uh, so there's these thousands of these churches of dead apostles and prophets, names, et cetera, et cetera, but will not believe that there stand among them living ones, living prophets, um, living leaders and apostles. Not only this, but like others of former time, they will distort and misapply the scriptures to defend a tradition. Though they crucify Christ's golden truth in so doing. You know, when you, uh, you know, we've just come off of Easter and you probably looked at some of the Easter scriptures. You probably maybe watched some of those Easter movies. And as you see, you know, if you're seeing or reading that stuff, I suspect that uh, when you see the Pharisees, uh, you know, Caiaphas, all those guys uh, push them to crucify Christ, you're probably thinking, at least in my case, how did they get in this position that when Christ came, they didn't see? How? That's what they were supposed to be looking for. And it goes right back to left put it very well. There's a dis distort, uh, distorting and a misapplying of the scriptures. And the tradition becomes more important than the purpose of that tradition. So he says here, let it be stated that we of the restoration faith were victims oft times of a prejudice that has been created by false education. I thought this was interesting. While nearly all churches and societies have been called upon to furnish a representation of themselves for publication. They get to represent themselves, uh, our enemies, or you know those interested in the overthrow of the church and work, have almost invariably been called upon to speak. Uh, you can definitely see that they just go YouTube about Mormonism, and you will see all kinds of things that aren't true. And everybody wants to speak for for the church except for and they don't want to let the church speak for itself and you see the thing with that is that's a tactic by the adversary if you're able to suppress the voice of the church the voice of the church can't reach others that need to hear it so looking at the church Mind you, we're talking about stumbling block. This for all first part has been setting up to some different things that we're going to find and uh, to help us define, define what those uh, stumbling blocks are. We have the gifts of the Spirit, or we should. You read 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, talks about those nine precious gifts, right? I think we could probably share various testimony of uh, different instances where we've been blessed by one or more of those gifts. 
And if not, uh, we can certainly look to recent church history and see that as well. Uh, I know I've got those four little books of testimonies that are full of those that I've been trying to share as much as I can. Of course, there's the warning. Here's a, a warning for us out of Moroni 7, uh, verse 27. Uh, could I have someone read that for us? Moroni 7, 27. I'll read it, Mark. All right. Uh, wherefore, my beloved brethren, hath miracles ceased, because Christ hath ascended into heaven, and hath sat down on the right hand of God, to claim of the Father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. All right, thank you. <clears throat> you know, there's, so there's that question today, uh, and, and you'll hear that. And, and unfortunately, we'll hear that in the restoration a little bit uh, from time to time. And uh, that, that's a problem. We need to work on that. Uh, miracles are not supposed to cease. Uh, I guess a spoiler alert there. Uh, the miracles are supposed to be running fluidly through the church. Uh, there's purpose for it, uh, multiple purposes for it, but that is the light of the church. Um, you know, if you saw at the beginning of the presentation, there's that picture of the church and all those letters on the windows, that's talking about the gifts of the spirit. That's what brings light in the, into the building, the windows, the church. Uh, very appropriate how that's represented on that diagram. Jesus has chosen his ministry and endowed them with supernatural gifts and declared that when the Comforter should come, it would testify of him and show them things to come. And we hold on to that uh, same promise today. <clears throat> so with that, the gifts of the Spirit, um, in today's realm, uh, the next couple of slides, we're going to get into a different aspect of this. Uh, Luff says the enemy stands at the bottom, uh, bottom of the slide here. The enemy stands ready to take advantage of the confidence of the people in these divine gifts to transform himself like unto an angel of light, if necessary, in order to deceive the very elect by his counterfeiting work. And that goes back to the first scripture of beware of false prophets. You know, so you can, you know, take, for example, a gift that we do not see uh, very prevalent in the church today would be the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. It's there, and it can uh, be realized. Um, and if you want to know why we don't see that, look at Moroni 7. Read the whole chapter. That can be some homework for you. But uh, you can go to some, you know, what uh, typically, uh, I believe Pentecostal are pretty big about this, where they just uh, kind of lash out in tongues and but there's no uh necessary purpose for it other than they believe that that's where you're born of the spirit and that is a form of right here it's uh counterfeiting the work it's not true uh, i've seen false spirits uh, uh false spirit of of the uh um gift of tongues before uh TJ, I don't know if you were up there for that reunion or not. No, you weren't. You were a little bit young for that. But that was an interesting experience. And there is, you know, from other things I've experienced that were true, there is a difference in the spirit, but you have to, you have to be grounded to be able to discern the truth from the false. So now we're getting into the exciting part. The restoration of the church. So remember what I told you about Paul the apostle. We we looked at his uh, what he had what his message was at, at least in Timothy is basically how horrible all you people are. Well, Joseph Smith wasn't his message wasn't much different. And Left points it out. He says his first declaration to the churches was, "You're all wrong, and your creeds are an abomination in God's sight." Well, that's certainly not going to get any popular votes. He said this on the strength of what the angel told him. He placed himself on record, openly before the world, 
in a way to invite criticism and condemnation rather than favor or flattery. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm trying to win votes, I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to want to be, I'm going to want to win favor. I'm going to want to flatter you. This is just the opposite. No hypocritical deceiver would ever attempt to openly denounce every other religion in existence with the hope of uh, ingratifying, boy, ingratitizing himself into the affections of those connected therewith. So Paul was like that. Joseph was like that. It wasn't a popular message. It was just calling out the truth. Acts 5.29 is the same thing. Someone want to read that line for me? Acts 5.29. I will. All right. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Thank you. You see, that's the key. That is one of the key things in discerning the fruit of who is a true uh, servant of God and who is not. The servant of God will stay consistent to a message, that message of repentance, no matter what the cost. You know, was it, wasn't it uh, Peter that was crucified upside down, I believe? His message never changed. Paul didn't have a very good ending either. A lot of those guys didn't. Stephen was a younger guy, and uh, he was martyred as well. And then you have others like Noah that, you know, they, they survive it, but they still had to go through some pretty rough things. But regardless, no matter what they had to go through, their message was the same. It was that message of repentance, and it was to do everything to please and to obey God, not to please man. And that kind of goes back to what Paul was saying, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So in that 1830 time period, the Book of Mormon comes forth. All you guys know that. But it, the Book of Mormon coming forth, it fulfilled Old Testament prophecies of the latter days. You can look at Isaiah 29. And Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> and that's something really worth studying. But uh, in uh, Isaiah 29, there's, uh, of course, there's a, there's a whole bunch more in the inspired version. But in the King James, there's still enough to point to this direction, the Book of Mormon coming forth. Uh, one of those things is, and I did not look up the verse, you can look it up, that's some good homework for you, but it talks about, I believe, uh, former and latter rain, and Lebanon is desolate, but it will become a fruitful field at some point in the future when Isaiah's writing this in, you know, whatever, B.C., 600 B.C., I think, and uh, that, that talks about this book, that's supposed to come forth. So this book in Isaiah that was supposed to come forth, it would have had to have come forth before Lebanon becomes a fruitful field again. And Luff goes into this and he talks a lot, gives a lot more insight to that. Um, and I think my mom was going to share something I asked her to. Are you, are you ready there? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting uh, because uh, Apostle Orson Hyde was sent, I think it was the April 1841 conference uh, to go to Europe and make his way in, into what was then Palestine and to Jerusalem. And he went there and on the morning of October 24th, 1841, he climbed up to the Mount of Olives and wrote and recited a prayer that was quite inspired. And he asked the Lord to uh, 
uh, prepare the land there for the returning of the Jews to their ancient homeland, as well as uh, uh, the building up again of Jerusalem. And then it wasn't uh, too much longer because the rains, the the rains that had come in the in the spring and the fall that they depended uh, upon for agriculture uh, had left after the dispersion of the Jewish people uh, for centuries. And uh, I think it was 1853 when the rains returned and Lebanon, the area there, Israel began to become a fruitful field once again. So that's quite interesting. And that there's no other book that's come forward in that time period that claims the same, uh, you know, authority from God, with, you know, with such revelation. And I just think that's really a mark of a divinity of the book and a fulfillment of the prophecy. Thank you for adding that. <clears throat> the church of jesus christ it was organized as it was in the beginning the church doesn't change as it was when jesus had it in the new testament days so thus in the 1830s a strange work had commenced upon the earth but we have to test it what's the fruit what but what of its doctrines what is it teaching what's the message does it repeat old theories that were presented during that time with a little bit of a different twist to it? Or does it adjust a tradition that's popular at the time? No, it does not at all. And you got to think in terms of, you know, here we are sitting in 2020, in 1830, the standard beliefs in Christianity was much, much different than it is today. Back then, uh, there certainly was no angels that would come and provide angel angelic ministry. The gifts of the Spirit were not a thing. That was in the New Testament days only, and there was no purpose for it in, that, in 1830. Uh, you had a, they were starting to transition to the idea of a uh, royal priesthood of believers rather than one to receive authority from God to perform the ordinances and preach as directed by the Holy Spirit. And by those things, they would believe in the changing God. And those were some of the, th some of the main things. There's others that uh, when the church is restored, that's the message that's being presented. There is an angelic ministry. God is unchanging, never wavering. His gifts of the Spirit do and will flow fluidly through the church. Ministers receive true authority from God. And I just threw that scripture on there uh, from the Great Commission message of Jesus in Mark 16. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. The message is the same. And just to let you know, too, on Ezekiel 37, uh, if you wanted to look at that, I think it's about verse 16 through 20 is the core of that prophecy where it talks about the two uh, scrolls, uh, sticks rather, uh, it, it represents them as sticks, but it's talking about their two books. You got the, and it, it's the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and join them together as one testimony, basically. So here's some other things that uh, the restoration the Church of Jesus Christ it was teaching uh, what the doctrine was being taught. And it's very different than what was taught back then. One was infant baptism, because infants were predestined to damnation, was a very common belief, and still is a belief today in, in some parts of Christianity. So there you have a slew of Scripture. You can look at Matthew 19 and 18 there 
won't take the time to read it, but it's the scriptures that, that talk about that Jesus didn't baptize, he blessed them. He laid hands on them. And if children were to, if infants were destined to damnation, then why, in order for us to dwell in the kingdom of heaven, would we have to become as a little child to be converted? It doesn't make sense. And Moroni, chapter 8 there, gives some really good insight. Uh, and, and apparently this wasn't the first time that we had this issue where we thought that uh, babies need and young children needed to be baptized. And you see that here that there's some, you know, arguments about whether you need to or don't need to. And so he inquires the Lord about it. And the Lord responds uh, saying that, you know, well, this is a gross error and it needs to be removed from our beliefs. Uh, because the Lord says, behold, I came into the world not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The righteous don't need to repent because they're righteous. Only sinners need to repent. The whole don't need a physician. I don't know about you, but when I'm healthy and strong, I, I typically don't go to the doctor. It's when I'm sick that I go to the doctor. Little children are whole. They don't need a physician. They're not capable of committing sin, right? And of course, we believe that. But it's good that, to recognize that this is where this scripture and all these scriptures weave together. You know, this was the restored gospel message, which was very different than what was taught initially. So that was a new idea. Another concept is the doctrine of hell. Back then, one of the big things was the fire and brimstone preaching need to be saved or you're going to go into fire and brimstone, you know, it's either heaven or hell. Well, if you really look at the scriptures, um, hell isn't a lake of fire and brimstone. So you can see a big circle around the false there, or at least I hope that's working out for you. Don't want anyone getting confused because that's not true, that hell is a lake of fire and brimstone. Because you look at Revelation 2014, and it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This is the second death. So obviously by common sense, hell can't dump, its, dump into itself. It's going from one place to another. You see in 1 Corinthians 15.41, the Protestant world does not know what to do with this scripture yet today. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, one st and for one star differs from another star in glory. And Joseph Luff ties these two scriptures together, and he basically says, you know, this whole, you know, you, you either need to, you know, accept Jesus or you're going to be burning in hell for eternity. Uh, there, there's some different areas for people to go. And of course, us of the Restoration Faith, we have section 76, and it gives us uh, more insight to this 1 Corinthians scripture. But you can see, just by this 1 Corinthians, it's not, uh, it's not a brand new message. It's just a restored message. <clears throat> and, there, so, and, and Luff goes on to talk about how there's different places for different people in as much as they want to be righteous to what extent that they want to get to. And that makes more sense with, uh, you, you know, you read, you know, the book of James and it talks about works and throughout the New Testament and the book of Mark talks about how you're going to be judged according to your works. So first Peter 318 through 20, uh, well, the part I really want to focus on is this shows us actually what hell is it's the prison house it's for which cause also he went and preached jesus preached unto the spirits in prison that's what he did when he was uh separated from the, his body there some of whom were disobedient in the days of noah so even those guys who then hearkened to the voice of noah they got to sit in the prison house for however time works in the prison house i, I couldn't tell you how that part works and 
so they got to hear the message a second time. I sure hope they, they got it the second time around. And, and, you know, really that shows how merciful and loving our God is. And you can look at that Genesis 7, and you can see uh, the connection there from 1 Peter 3 to Genesis 7. So, stumbling blocks. There's different types of stumbling blocks. Uh, pride is one of them. And that's one thing we kind of lead, uh, get into here in 2 Nephi 11, 9, chapter 11, verse 90 through 96. Could I get a reader for this one? A little bit longer of a one. I can, Mark. All right. Second Nephi 11, 90-96. And the Gentiles are... Well, I think you might be cutting out there. Either you are or I am. ...face of the poor. And there are many churches built up which cause envies and strifes and malice and there are also secret combinations even as in times of old according to the combinations of the devil for he is the foundation of all these things yea the foundation of murder and works of darkness yea and he leadeth them by the neck with the flaxen cord until he bindeth them with his strong cords forever for behold my beloved brethren i say unto you that the Lord God worketh not in darkness. He doeth not anything, save it be for the benefit of the world. For he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he may draw all men unto him. All right, thank you. We kind of lost you on the first couple verses, but it captured about 92 on. Appreciate that. Um, so at verse 90, that's where it talks about the stumbling block. Yeah. Uh, and it says that they were lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of, and because of this greatness of their stumbling block, they build up many, many churches. You see, uh, the pride is a big issue, and we need to be very careful of that because we can fall into that same boat. And then that pride causes us to stumble, and it causes us to lose focus on what we're supposed to be doing. And it's not to bring honor and glory to ourselves, it's to bring honor and glory to God. And it goes on there through the, you know, there are many churches, they build up envy and strife, malice. You know, there's that, there's several places, uh, and it says, if you're not one, you're not mine. We need to be one, united, body. And, and that's to all the Christian world. We need to become one. Uh, because it causes a stumbling block for others, too, when there's the, all these different messages going about. Uh, it, and that kind of goes to the next verse here coming up in Alma. But the whole purpose, it goes to 96, that he may draw all men unto him. That's the whole purpose of this whole thing, is to draw everybody to Jesus Christ. And if, it's, and if every, uh, everything that we do, if it doesn't do that, we're actually becoming a stumbling block for ourselves and also for others. Okay, a couple slides there. <clears throat> Jacob chapter 3 uh, talks about another stumbling block. Now, could I have a reader for this one, Jacob 3, 22 through 25? I can read. All right. But behold, the Jews were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness and killed the prophets and sought for the things that they could not understand. Understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. 
For God hath taken away his plainness from them, and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand, because they desired it. And because they desired it, God hath done it, that they may be that they may stumble. Whoa, whoa, whoa. TJ, you're saying that uh, God's making them stumble. That's what I read there in 25. But in all seriousness, though, it's he gives the answer there in the first part. It's because they desired it. And really, how sad is that? You know, God doesn't want that. You know, he takes away the plainness from them and delivers them to the many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. I don't know about you, but as I listened to TJ read that, my mind was going not to the Jews, which is what it's initially talking about, but I saw history repeating itself to a people today here in America. Uh, we've been given so many things that we just don't understand, and we're searching for answers in all the wrong places. And God's done it again. He's, he's given us exactly what we wanted. More things for us to look at than what we can even begin to understand. Because that's what we're desiring. Rather than desiring the truth from God. And if you look at society, society today, we do stumble. And we stumble pretty good. And we become blind. Which goes to this one. Ooh, I hope you guys can see it all. I, I, it cut off for me a little bit, but it's 2 Thessalonians. And it's uh, chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. Uh, whoop, I see a hand here, Steve. Are you there, Steve? Okay. We'll come back to you, Steve. Uh, I think you're on mute. You're still on mute there if you're trying to talk. Uh, Second Nephi, or <laughs> Nephi, Thessalonians, uh, chapter two. Oh, did you get there, Steve? Yeah, I think so. My my phone device, I guess, isn't getting accepted. But the uh, point I wanted to make was. One of the things that the, the disciples pointed out to Jesus, he says, you're, you're not explaining these parables to them, like the parable of the sower. And Jesus said that, uh, and it's all related to a number of verses that go all the way back to Isaiah, that uh, he would, uh, by seeing, they would be blinded and so forth. And uh, that's an interesting cross-reference to look at. Um, I'll have to share it sometime when I have the verse available. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So going along with that, that Jacob chapter, what was it? Chapter three. I just, uh, we won't take the time to read this whole thing, but second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 11 and or 10 and 11. It says, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's the same thing we just read in Jacob chapter 3. The key thing is we have got to have a love for the truth. And that's about one of the number one, probably the number one problem that the majority of people have today is we've lost our first love as Revelations of chapter 2 or 3 says, our love needs to be for Jesus. Absolute number one. He's the truth. You know, in verse 12 there, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's pretty serious. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I don't want to be in that boat. And I know you don't either. So here is a different type of stumbling block. I had to grab this one. It's Alma 2. So you see there in verse 16, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of things going on. Envy and strife, malice, persecutions, pride, 
Notice pride was there again. Even to exceed the pride of those who did not belong to the church of God. You catch that? The people in the church became more prideful than the ones who were outside of the church. In verse 17, the wickedness of the church was a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church, and thus the church began to fail in its progress. Now, I don't know about you, but as you read that in, out of Alma 2 there, you probably saw history repeating itself again, uh, maybe today. Pride is a very big issue. And so if we become prideful, uh, just like the children of Israel became prideful, uh, it, it's a stumbling block for people coming into the church. So we've got to be very, very, very careful of that. Because we let pride enter in, the other stuff comes in, the envy and the strifes, the malice, even the persecution. You know, maybe it's uh, it can get to the point that we persecute those that aren't in the church because of maybe how they live or something. And, and maybe they are doing wrong things, but how we respond to it is very important. And uh, it will either go to the growth or to the uh, decline of the church. Uh, I think, Steve, you had your hand up? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't want to be a, a big mouth here, but I wanted to point out that that I honestly believe that the pride and those issues, if you do a really deep, intense study on the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians, uh, it, it's so deeply related to pride. And I think that even as a church today, if we are not very careful, we can get sucked up into it because it's so blinding yep that's very true thank you no i appreciate all the input that you want to give steve now we're running short on time so i'm not gonna have us really dig into this a whole lot but uh if you take the time to read first nephi chapter three about verse 160 well a little before like verse 155 through about 187. Uh, it talks about, it's Nephi's, uh, or rather it's the Lord showing Nephi things to come from his point to uh, the return of, of Christ and his coming glory. And he sees all kinds of things. He sees, uh, he sees like Christopher Columbus. He sees how the Gentiles come on over here, us, and he also sees that the, abom the great and abominable church, it takes away the precious and the plain truths from the gospel of the Lamb out of the book, the Bible, is what it's talking about. <clears throat> and it's interesting in, in their verse, uh, well, 169, and many covenants of the Lord have, have they taken away. So the not you know and and look at our inspired version how we have Genesis where it talks about faith repentance and baptism from the very beginning we know that Adam was baptized and that it's the same message all the way along it wasn't a, a evolving adapting message and way to do it it was the same from the beginning and so those things were taken away all this they've done that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, and it causes so it causes confusion that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of children of men. We see that today, and that becomes a stumbling block. And as you read that, if you know anything about uh, some of the Hebraisms, you'll see. You'll, I'm not very good at pointing them out, but there's just a flow to it, and you can start to see that it does have that uh, chiasm type flow to it <clears throat> and uh anyway it goes on here and it talks about how it'll be the message will be restored but 183 it says and after the gentiles do stumble exceedingly because this is why they stumble it's because the plain message 
the plain, precious parts of the gospel, they're taken out. And so it becomes kind of hard to see what the truth is because of this muddled message. message. And that goes along with uh, 2 Nephi 12 that we won't take the time to read here tonight, but I have here on the screen verse 53 through 64. But it talks about, you know, uh, the same message that you hear today when you talk about, well, here's a Book of Mormon given a second testimony of Jesus. They'll say, uh, well, we've got a Bible. We don't need any more Bible. And, uh, you know, the Lord responds here, uh, you know, well, why are you murmuring, murmuring because, you know, you receive more of my word than just one book? <laughs> Don't you understand that I speak the same words unto one nation like I do to the other because I'm an unchanging God? I am not a, uh, a respecter of persons. Kind of goes back to the first message, uh, topic. So why does he do this? Why does he tell the message to everybody? He does this to prove that he's the same yesterday, today, and, to, and forever. He continues to prove that uh, he he's unchanging. His work is not finished, and neither shall it be. This is a key thing. So if you think about all these things that the restored gospel message, which is different from what was presented uh, during the, the time where the, the restoration, restoration of the church came about, you know, he had angelic ministry, uh, authority of priesthood, uh, all the others I had listed there. His work's not finished, and it won't be finished until the end of man. Neither from that time henceforth and forever. So his work is, is always going about. So there's going to be no change in how he does things. And uh, this is just, uh, if you want to write down some scriptures here for you to kind of give you some tools in your tool bag to talk about with your, your uh, Christian friends outside of the restoration. Uh, what's the Bible say about God speaking? You look at Revelation 22, 18, 19, that's where a lot of folks will go. And they'll say, well, it says, uh, you know, you're not supposed to add or take away from the book. Yeah, well, you got to look at a couple things. One, the Bible wasn't compiled yet at that point when John was writing that. It was talking about specifically the book of Revelation. Just don't change the message. This is the message. Don't change it. You know, and and you get that same uh, concept from Deuteronomy four two. There it says you should not add unto the word which I command, neither shall you diminish from it. <clears throat> And it's interesting, I don't know how many times I pointed this out to folks. And they'll bring up that point about Revelation. And I say, well, why don't you look at Deuteronomy? And they'll give the, the correct interpretation on Deuteronomy that, well, yeah, it's not about, there, shouldn't, there should not be a Deuteronomy 4, verse 3. It's that we're not supposed to change his word. Exactly. Same thing with Revelation. So to conclude some things for you here, there's, like I said earlier, there's a lot of noise. And we need to be able to, to discern the truth. We need to avoid stumbling blocks. And we need to avoid being the stumbling block. And one of the big things of that is to uh, ensure that we don't have pride in our hearts. Probably all the different forms of the stumbling blocks it all uh, boils down to pride as the source of that stumbling block. History repeats itself again and again and again. The message of truth is typically not received well, and it's usually pretty blunt. Uh, Paul the Apostle was pretty good at that. Noah was pretty good at that. So was Joseph Smith and anyone else who, who's a true servant of God. And the last thing there, there's, script, there's clear scriptural evidence. If one seeks the truth out of the word of God, God ha, you'll find that God has restored his church at the, pre, at the precise time to usher in his kingdom. And we're living in the final moment of that, which is an exciting time for us. 
and that kind of goes back to uh, realizing how the Book of Mormon, it had to come forth at that proper moment uh, as described in Isaiah in order for it to, uh, everything to weave together appropriately, just like Jesus uh, in the meridian of time fulfilling all the prophecies. It's Jesus doing it again. He's fulfilling his prophecies as he goes about his work. So I'll leave you with this. As we study together, we need to come now and let us reason together. In course, of this is the message of repentance. Say, Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So for our next uh, uh, meeting, we'll, uh, it'll be on May 21st, and we'll be talking about the topic all or none. And that's a little bit shorter of a, a topic, at least from a page number anyway. So hopefully we'll be able to keep that one to an hour. I appreciate you guys staying on here. Hope you've uh, been fed by it and, and encouraged to get into your scriptures uh, and study this out a little bit more.